Hi guys, it's John back again with another, another model company overview. This is the eighth in the series and this is probably the most anticipated overview of a model company that I can think people have been looking forward to very much indeed. Today we're going to be talking about Airfix. Now Airfix is synonymous with the plastic modelling world in as much that if you were to say I want to do a plastic model kit to the average Joe on the street, they may not completely understand what your intentions are. But if you were to tell them that I'm going to start an Airfix kit tonight, they'll know instantly what you mean. The fact of the matter is, is that Airfix has become a household name for everything linked to the plastic modelling world, and yet they were not anything like the first model company following in the footsteps of companies such as Skybirds and Frog. Skybirds models were initially made from solid blocks of wood that needed to be wrought into the planned shapes prior to assembly. They were quite labour intensive to construct and Skybirds had made wooden and metal toys amongst other products since about 1932. They closed down at the beginning of the war and reopened later in 1945 as Skybirds 86. But it was Frog that started building a form of plastic aircraft in 1936 when they built a range of flying kits that were powered by elastic bands. In fact, it was where they got their name from. Flown right off the ground. Frog. They continued to build plastic aircraft for the military for identification purposes during World War II. Now, Airfix was founded in 1939 by a Hungarian Jewish refugee by the name of Nicholas Cove. And strangely enough, the Airfix brand name didn't come from anything to do with aircraft or modelling, but as a result of Cove liking words ending in fix. He wanted the company's name to begin with the letter A to ensure that the company was on the first page of any telephone directory and was very quick and easy to find, and so Airfix was the name chosen. The frog kits were not injection moulded, but of a cellulose acetate butylate mixture and when Airfix came on the scene in 1939, they made a range of cheap rubber toys filled with air and a number of plastic toys, aircraft and figures as well. Later he introduced injection moulding machinery into Britain to make items more commonly found in households like kitchen accessories and storage units made from plastic. At one time, Airfix was the largest manufacturer of combs in the United Kingdom. Airfix's debut into the world of plastic models came in 1949 when Massey Ferguson commissioned Airfix to produce a tractor from their range to be used for sales purposes and Airfix sold a number of tractors to Massey Ferguson that had to be assembled by skilled workers at the Airfix plant prior to delivery. Airfix were granted the right to sell the tractor in Woolworths at a retail price of two shillings. That's about ten pence in modern money. But the only way to meet the price limit was to make the kit from polystyrene parts and supply the tractor in kit form for the customer to assemble themselves. They were packed in poly bags and paper headers were put on the top and they were sold as model kits. And so the injection moulded Airfix kit was born. Airfix was the first company to produce an injection moulded construction kit anywhere in the world. And Woolworths was so impressed with the sales success of the tractor that they approached Airfix for a follow-on kit. And in 1952 Airfix released the Golden Hind. The kit included plastic parts poly rigging and was released in 1 300th scale. Follow-on kits to the Golden Hind came in the form of the Santa Maria and the Cutty Sark and Airfix also released two more kits in those early years that were now considered quite rare. These kits are the BTK Spitfire and the now very rare SS Southern Cross. It is believed that if you have an Airfix Southern Cross in your collection and it's sealed and unmade, it should be stored in a safe. In 1962 Airfix released their first two airliner kits in the shape of the Caravelle and the Comet, beginning the Sky King range of 1-144 scales airliners. Later releases included the Hanley Page HP-42 Heracles and the Boeing Clipper 
a number of 50s, 60s and 70s airliners like the Vanguard, the Trident and the DC-9, and a couple of wide-body jets like the DC-10 and the TriStar, and also, of course, the iconic Concorde and the Boeing 747. All these airliner kits were sometimes quite tricky to assemble because you had to poke the decals out with a tool before fitting the cabin windows prior to assembly of the airframe, but on the whole, they were pretty reasonable and high quality. In 1962, they also acquired Rosebud Incorporated Kitmaster models and added a full range of railway kits and 0080 scale, incorporating models of locomotives, shunting yard machinery and rolling stock, and a very wide range of trackside accessories forming part of their now fairly large inventory. There was, however, an oddity in the form of the 1 16th scale aerial arrow motorcycle that also formed part of the Kitmaster deal. Now, Airfix released the, the Series O sailing ships and a some larger sailing ship kits, which were an exception to their constant scale concept. The Aerial Arrow was joined in the 1960s and 70s by several other motorcycle kits, and a range of dinosaurs also fell into this group. But Airfix chose the constant scale concept for everything else in their range. In 1 600th scale, that's equivalent to 1 inch to 50 foot for the ocean liners and warships. Later they also did a number of ships connected to the Sink the Bismarck saga in 1 1200th scale. And 1 144th scale for their airliners and space vehicles. In 00HO scale, which is close to 176th, they built locomotives and railway accessories, some military vehicles and figures. In 172nd scale, they used that for the aircraft and some small combat aircraft. Uh, combat boats. They also made aircraft in 148 scale and a number of 135th scale military vehicles were added to their range late in the 1970s and 80s. In 132nd scale this scale was kept for the vintage and modern car range to keep in line with the scale extric style airfix track racing toy. The idea was to have the body shells of the cars clip onto the racing car chassis. Later, a range of multi-post figures and military vehicles were added to the 32nd scale range also. Also, aircraft were built in 124th scale in the form of the Airfix Super Kits, and also a range of cars, quite a large range of cars, were added to the 124th scale range, and some 125th scale cars were also added later. You can't ever forget the, the fantastic 1971 release of the 112 scale Airfix Bentley, the 4.5 litre Bentley blower, which is truly an amazing model. The kits were released in a wide range of colours aimed at moulding the kits in similar colours to the paint scheme of the finished product. The colours used were white, light grey, silver grey, yellow, light blue, midnight blue, green, red, desert sand and black. Just for interest's sake, the kit in front of you is the 12th scale 1971 release of the Bentley, which recently has been released by Hornby Hobbies Limited in their red Type 16 boxes. Can you remember, or can anyone out there remember, what the plastic colour used for the Bentley was when it was originally released in 1971? The modern release kit is released in light grey with a a sprue of chrome and some rubber tyres and parts. But what colour was the plastic in 1971? It probably wouldn't surprise you to know that it was green. Here's the modern day release down here with the rubber parts all on display and here's the nice tidy compartment for this kit with a really nice instruction leaflet, some metal parts with cogs, the chrome parts there and the green parts pretty similar to the, car, the, the colour of the car itself. I'm pretty sure there was also a black sprue in there as well, but don't quote me, I'm not 100% certain. One of the other features of the 12th scale 4.5 litre Bentley was that you could add a small prop motor style motor, electric motor, and it provided you with all the metal parts, the shafts and cogs to drive the back wheels. And I'm not sure again, but I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure that the... Um, the steering column was linked to the front wheel, so when you turn the steering wheel, the front wheels moved. They steered. 
interesting feature on that kit. Now, Airfix launched a range of adversary sets called Dogfight Doubles in the early 1960s. I think this kit was released in about 1964. Um, initially starting with World War I biplane sets and then moving on to World War II and post-war model sets as well. They were the only company to release Dogfight Doubles as a standard model and not as a special release or limited release kit. The kits used on these models were pretty old tool kits but one or two of them were not so bad like the Cessna 02 and the MiG-21 and the MiG-15 and the Mirage 3C pictured here. The modern sets released by Hornby are on the main new tool kits and so they're really really good excellent quality models even venturing into 148 scale kits with the BF-109 and the Spitfire Mark V-B. Airfix released a number of kits that were film themed and television themed, starting with the Pan American spacecraft from 2001 Space Odyssey, yeah the famous Orion. They later built the Angel Interceptor from the TV series Captain Scarlet and please don't forget the amazing and wonderful 007 themed Aston Martin DB5, the Toyota 2000 GT and Little Nelly, yeah the autogyro from You Only Live Twice. All in 132nd scale accompanied by Oddjob and 007 himself. The X-Wing and TIE fighters as well as other subjects from Star Wars. There were a number of kits from Space 1999 as in the Eagle Transporter and Hawk spacecrafts. They were all covered. Hell, there was even a model released of the Monkey Mobile from the TV series The Monkeys. It was a truly and fantastic range and Airfix were reading the market incredibly well. There was, however, in my opinion, one serious mistake, and it was in the terrible choice to customise the Ford Capri, Cortina and the Zephyr models, robbing future modellers of these three wonderful cars. These are the results of what Airfix did when they brutalised, the <laughs> absolutely destroyed and brutalised the, um, the moulds on these three really good kits. Airfix released a monthly magazine, um, which was loaded with hints, tips, profiles and stories, as well as reference materials for modelling projects and new releases called the Airfix magazine. They also set up an Airfix Modelers Club with monthly offers and competitions advertised through the magazine and the pamphlets found in every Airfix kit. One of the most famous precedents of the Airfix Modelers Club was Dick Emery, a popular TV comedian in the 1970s. Now, during the 1960s and 70s, Airfix sold a number of different products as follows. They produced a number of action toys, i.e. the skydiver and the diving sub, etc., these kits here were the mini aeroplane kits that were started to be flooding the market in 1949. Very, very interesting was also the interchangeable world of the Micronauts. These were models that you could interchange parts with to produce new toys. Airfix also produced a motor racing slot car set, which was like their version of Scared Extra. They also produced a railway set similar to... Uh, Hornby and Choyang Hornby and Lima and these sets were electrified just like ordinary train sets and you could also use the WHO st sc um, sorry, scale static locomotives as park-ups in the shunting yards and ver various bits and bobs. Airfix also did a couple of toy guns for children to play war with. I never had one of these two but um, I think I could have fancied the FN rifle. Airfix also produced an alternative to Lego in the Better Builder sets. These blocks were quite a bit larger than Lego um, and they built much more sturdier buildings. But of course they were less versatile than Lego and so really never really hit the market as well as Lego ever did. Airfix also produced a number of combat packs, starting with the Airfix Combat Pack and Desert Combat Pack. And these generally utilise the polyvinyl cars, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, in WHO scale, but they also produced a number of diorama combat packs which were designed to use the figures um, in coerce with the actual packs themselves. A lot of them came with figures included. 
the pontoon bridge assault set I remember having myself um, and I had a pattern a centurion tank and I'm pretty sure I had an ACP with two packs of figures um, probably would have been the commandos and the German infantry that was featured in this picture and also that god awful gun emplacement which um, was never that good a kit but it was fun to play with Airfix also produced a funny thing called the Datamatic car. This was a car that you pre-programmed with a data disk and it followed a preset course laid out by the data disk and the car you could make the car do lots of different things. Um, probably limited fun <laughs> but it was very much a novelty at the time nothing else like it on the market. They also did a number of adventure toys. I remember the super flight deck with the power launcher I didn't have it, but a friend of mine had it who lived up the road, and we had a lot of fun with that, with that plastic phantom coming on off the deck. There were also the Super Eagles, there were Pinhead, and the Craft Time Games, and the Space Warriors. These were a 1980s kit, and also, of course, the Zoo and Farm Animals play sets that were extremely popular in the 70s. They even did a Fighter Command game, which was a form of a board game based on the Battle of Britain. Then... You also had the polyvinyl military vehicles, which incorporated a landing craft. These kits were pre-made. They were all green, um, except for the landing craft, which I believe was grey. Um, but they were designed for children to buy, take home and play with, rather than build up and put on your side. Um, and then you can't forget the 1970s and 80s phenomenon of the Weebles and Weebles playset. I don't know of anybody who didn't have access or had some of this stuff in their house when they were a child. And then, of course, you've got the models themselves. Don't forget those. Now, everything was hunky-dory with new kits coming off into the shops at a rate of approximately one a month when the oil crisis hit in the latter half of 1979. And Airfix started to run into financial problems. These were the same problems that saw companies like Frog, Remus, Esai and Aurora sent bust. And in 1981, Airfix was bought up lock, stock and barrel by Mattel Incorporated, managed by their toy division, Palatoy. The first thing Palatoy did was to drastically reduce the range being produced at any one time. They started building the kits and limited runs to try and reduce the amount of dead cash tied up in stock. And this process took about 12 months to accomplish and then they, lock, they looked at the image Mattel wanted for Airfix as a brand. And Palatoy wanted something far removed from what was seen as the normal and came up with a novel idea. They began reboxing the kits showing the model made up on a blueprint and they didn't just keep this for the aircraft subjects, they used this format for everything. New kit releases were rare but some kits were released such as their famous Vulcan bomber and the B1 Lancer kit as well. Sorry, I've got these slides all out of trim, but this is basically showing you how they they transposed from what was the norm over to the blueprint boxings, and they were very, very different. And here's one of their latest releases, of course, the Vulcan Bomber and the B1 Lancer. Both these kits were really, really nice, although the B1 did have an issue with its um, canopy fitting and the fuselage was a little bit of a problem and the Vulcan always had fit issues with its main airframe. But the A10 Thunderbolt 2 was a really, really nice kit and the Sikorsky CH-53 Sea Stallion was also released in 1982. These models were all very, very good quality. Things started to pick up when the second oil crisis hit during the middle of the 1980s and although Airfix as a company was doing pretty well, Mattel in general weren't. In 1985 the Welsh railway firm Dopol models bought the mainline section of Airfix and in so doing acquired all of the OHO scale railway orientated kits. The remainder of Airfix was sold in 1986 to Board and Incorporated. USA and Humbrol Group was the division that took charge, which also incorporated Heller, and so the whole organisation was shipped to France. Now, during the move, one of the Airfix kit's jigs was lost. 
ironically it was the SS France. Making this kit a very expensive purchase on the second hand market virtually overnight, some France ships still sell for stupid money even today. And it's not unusual to find Airfix kits in Heller boxes and vice versa, as Humbrol Group cashed in on the Airfix brand. Here you can see the Hawker Hurricane, which was actually an Heller release kit, but it's also the Hurricane found in this boxing of the Battle of Britain Memorial flight. You also had the Vampire Airfix boxing, which was originally the Mistral in the Heller kit. This is exactly the same kit, but found in an Airfix box, but it's actually a Heller model. You also had the Airfix Supra Tondard, which was actually the Humbrol and Heller version of the Supra Tondard fighter. But also, of course, you found Airfix kits and Heller boxes. The Mil Mi 24 Hind A and D could be found in the Heller box here. The Douglas A1J Sky Raider was found in a Heller box. And also the P38 F and H Lightning was found in a Heller box. Hell, even the 24 scale super kits were found in Heller boxes. Um, they, they released all of them, the Stuka, the Harrier, everything. They released everything in Heller boxes. Boom years were again apparent. Again, with but again, financial problems were facing Humbrol in much the same way that they faced Palatoy in the mid 1980s. Airfix was up for sale again, and in a source of, and, and a source of cash was found from Ireland when Allen and Maguire purchased Humbrol Group in 1992. This time, sorry, this was the time when kits were reboxed in Airfix brandings, orientating from the Czech Republic and Japan. Things ran okay for a number of years until the receivership people stepped in and put Airfix up on the market yet again. Hornby Productions stepped in with a deal securing the purchase in 2006 and Airfix appears not to have looked back from this deal. In 2008, JB Models was acquired by Hornby and so the entire JB Models kit range was reboxed by Airfix. Now, Hornby has had a very positive effect on Air Airfix as a company with virtually every new kit release being of a top-notch level. Kits such as their Victor, the Shackleton, the 72nd scale Phantom II, Blenheim and Bowfighters, and of course the Warus, Sea Fury and Meteor in 148th are all absolutely fabulous toolings. Present kits presently sold by Airfix in the new red box labelling and boxings are aircraft in 144th scale, 100, uh, 172nd scale, 148th and 24th scale, ships in 1200th scale, 1700th scale, 1600th scale, 1400th scale, 1350th scale and 1180th scale, also in 1130th scale and 72nd scale. They also build a number of military vehicles these are found in 176 scale, 172nd scale, 148th scale and 132nd scale. And Airfix also re release a range of buildings in 76th, 72nd, 148th and 132nd. There is a range of cars in 132nd scale and of course the 12th scale Bentley. There's also a number of engineering kits which are quite interesting as well. Sorry, not forgetting the fact that they build figures in 176 scale, 148th and 132nd scale, and a number of quick build kits are featured in 172nd and 32nd scale. I like to feature the engineering <laughs> kits, but I've gone out of line. Sorry about that. The engineering kits are basically pit, um, depicting engines, but there were a number of old tools that were released as well. The Trifethic Loco, I think, was released, and also the Beam engine, um, which were quite interesting. And these are new new icon releases by Hornby and they're they're full working models, they're really, really interesting. Also, of course, you had the diorama playsets. These were produced in 176th, 172nd, 148th, and 132nd. Now what I want to do quickly now is I want to take you through the boxing history. Because the boxing history is quite interesting the way things have pained through. Um the original boxing um, started off with a Type O, 
But before we go into the boxing, I want to explain something about the instruction leaflets as well, because the instruction leaflets, have, they've evolved through the, through the years as well. In the Type O and Type 1 headers, similar to the Vickers Submarine BTK Spitfire that you can see here. Yes, this is the original instruction leaflet that came with the BTK Spitfire. And as you can see, everything is in one picture. Everything, all the parts are all loaded into one picture, even the stand. But there's a text box here which tells you exactly what you've got to do, how you've got to do it, and when you've got to do it. Now, this is the Type 2 header, and this is another um, idea where you've got virtually everything in one box. The only thing that's missing, I'm pretty sure, is the undercarriage and the cockpit assembly, which goes on the Spitfire Mark 9. Yeah, this is a Johnny Johnson Spitfire that was pretty awful as well. Uh, you'll see images of this later. Um, but this is a Type 2 heading, and again, you've got a text box at the bottom here which tells you exactly how to put everything together, when and, and why, and everything else. And then you moved into the Type 3 assembly instructions, and this is for the Angel Interceptor. And you'll note that the exploded views are similar in, in concept to the Type 1. But you've got information here on the aircraft itself and stats and build instructions here, which, which are pretty general. But you've still got the text boxes at the bottom here, which tell you how to put everything together with a paint guide there underneath. And this was the Type 3 format. It was the last time... The Type 3 was the last time that instruction leaflets carried the text boxes, which ID'd all the parts and gave you full build instructions in writing. After the Type 3, the Type 4 and 5 assembly instructions went over to this type of format. This was the one used by Airfix prior to the Palatoy takeover, where all the stages were all split into small sections and you had them all itemised with very easy follow easy to follow arrows pointing to exactly what you've got to do with the optional parts all laid out in separate boxes. The paint guide was then split into two sections according to the different versions that you had decals for. And this one is the Type 8 and 9 style instruction leaflet which was used by Palatoy. You note how the actual um, build instructions are very much simplified. There are no arrows apart from where you don't cement which I always thought was a bit weird. Um, and again, you've got optional parts listed here, but this is the format used by Palatoy. More modern formats go into the boxing style uh, segregated um, sub-assemblies, which were used on an awful lot of models produced by Airfix during the 1990s. And this style of boxing is quite common. Um, this one is actually carried over into the female tank, which is presently released by um, Hornby Hobbies. But it's the, same in, it's the same instruction leaflet that you get in the Hornby Hobbies as was released before. Um, and then, of course, you've got the modern-day Hornby-style instruction leaflets. And I really quite like these. They add a little bit of colour, which adds interest to the, the plans. But they also show you the sub-assembly in a different colour. And some of the bits and bobs that need special attention are all clearly marked. And it was a real treat to see a change in the instruction leaflets from what I often found was a complicated and difficult to follow format. Um, you had to read the instructions very carefully to make sure that you didn't make a mistake when you were building them. This is a lot easier to follow. Now the boxing history. The Type O boxing history. These were the first headers used by Airfix in 1952 and this format carried through to 1959. And the reason why it carried through to 1959 is very straightforward and easy. Type 0 was applied to bag kits and header kits up till 1956. But the Type 1 boxings, which was this style, with the small different coloured icons at the side with a picture of the, the kit, it wasn't actually a painting, it was just a picture of the kit formed on the right-hand side of the header. But Type 1s were only applied to Series 1 and 2 models that were formed in a bag kit. Type O carried through to 1959 if the kit required a box, and the box style was similar to this. The Airfix Lancaster was actually the first multi-engine model produced by Airfix. If you have one of these, it's quite an interesting build, but quite dire. Box Type 2 flew from 1939 to 1963, and these are quite easily identifiable by the fact that they have a white and red line border on the right-hand side, and sometimes a white and red line border on the left-hand side. It depends which way they printed the box at the time. 
It covered both boxes and bag header kits. This is the Hawker Heart, which of course was um, the, the mould for the Hawker Heart was altered to produce the Hawker Demon. So you can still get the Hawker Heart on the market here and there. Type 3 style boxings run from 1963 to 1971 and these were the famous red stripe kits. These were formatted on all the boxes and all of the bag kits but they weren't always red stripes. Some were blue and some were yellow and some were green depending on the type of kit sold at the time. Type 4 ran from 1971 to 75. These did away with the uh, the red stripe and put the Airfix logo on the top of the box. Um, they still had box lids at this time. All of the kits were released with box lids. And the bag headers, this is actually a Type 4B and that is a Type 4C. The 4C was the blister packs and they ran from 1972 to about 1975. Then in 1975 the Type 5A boxing appeared uh, and they ran until about 1977 and they were replaced by the Type 5B which ran until about 1978. The interesting difference between the Type 4, uh, 5A and 5B is that the 5A didn't have some, I like, it was explanatorative information underneath the subject matter for the kit and it was written underneath. I've got a couple of kits in, in Type uh, 5B boxes and they're quite interesting. Um, Type 6, Type 6A above, these had the planetoid logos in the top left hand side um, and they covered an awful lot of kits that were released and re-released as new but this is actually the same old tool kit that was released in the red stripe days from 1964-65 and the 6B um, boxing which also ran concurrently with uh, from 1978 until 1981 with the 6As these were introduced because of a law that was passed in Britain where by uh, in 1978 the government decreed that all toys which were sold to children in the UK were never to have any form of violence or war evidence appearing on their boxes. They were trying to take violence out of children's worlds completely and this actually caused Airfix to have an awful lot of... Um, if you like photoshopping out but they had to do it with paint of some of the boxings well not some it was quite a lot of them they even went to the extent of um, re-feathering certain propellers on aircraft that had been shot up like the the Lancaster bomber kit the B-17 and a number of other models I think the Wellington was another one that had a feathered propeller and they had to be re-feathered and painted in as still turning otherwise the children would have known that they'd been shot up by something during the war. Type 7 boxings, which contain the snap and glue kits, 1981-82. to 82. These were an experiment by Airfix to produce a number of kits that were predominantly snap fit, with a few of the parts which were to be fitted um, by gluing them together. And then you had the Type 8, the Blueprint Palatoy boxes, which were introduced in 1982. They ran through to about 1982 to 1988, and the two images on the box right are Heller's first boxing styles of the Type 9s, and they ran from 1988 to 1990. Um, the way you can tell a first edition Heller kit is the louvred border on the left-hand side of the box. This was the only boxing that Heller released with this style of uh, ID. They were in various different colours and also this kit here which is actually a type 8 model was still snap and glue and it was one of the kits left over from the days where they were trying to get rid of a lot of the stock and try and reduce some of the tied up cash and the dead stock and everything. Um, and again the, the Palatoy models here you can see them here that's a Chieftain tank and that's an F5A. Two different complete genres of kits on the same style of boxing. Then in 1990, the Type 10 style box appeared, and these were the, the famous white bordered window framed boxes. They came in two styles predominantly, but the first style was basically for the aircraft of the Aces, World War I and World War II kits. Um, and also the second style were for everything. Everything else was utilised in this box style, um, where you had a white border around the outside, and 
the Series 3 HO00 or 72nd scale or whatever label would have been fitted into this side here. Um, also, you had Type 11 boxes, and these ran up to about 2001, and these were the first kits that had the skill level graphs printed on the actual box lids. These kits, I think, still had lids. They didn't have open ends. These were lidded boxes as well, which were quite interesting. Then, in 2002, the Type 12 boxes, these boxes had lids as well. These were interesting because they were an image from the original paintings superimposed on some sort of weird planet orbiting picture, <laughs> which was a high level graphic uh, that Hella used. Um, some of these kits were open ended and they didn't have lids, but most of them had lids. Um, they were a very unusual and unique style of boxing. But also the Type 13 boxes were also running concurrently in 2002 to 2003. But the Type 13 boxes were only used for these two sets of, um, well, these two set kits. You had the World Rallycross Cars Racing set in 143rd scale and a set of three motorcycles, including riders, in the motorcycle racing set as well. And they were the only two kits found in Type 13 boxes. Type 14 Another unusual box. These are very easily identified by a circular skills graft. Um, but I found these boxes quite interesting because they were full width box lids. Um, some of them, were, again, were open ended box lids, but um, they showed the aircraft or the, the, uh, the, the subject matter in full, full size across the box width. It was really quite ingen ingenuitive. And then in, in 2004 to 2008, the Type 15 A and B ran as well. And these, these were quite nice boxes as well. I quite like these. Um, they were quite interesting. The thing you have to also remember is that... Um, I'm just trying to see which box lids it was. Yes, it was in Type 11 boxes. The boxes in Type 11, which ran between 1998 and 2001 were the first boxes released where all Series 1 to 2 and 3 were found in boxes of similar size. And this, I think, was a cost reduction program. Um, a lot of these kits' sizes carried over as a Series 2 kit, but a lot of Series 1 and Series 3 kits were found in boxes of this size as well. Um, and the Type 15B just had, can you see the yellow and black writing? Well, these are Type 15Bs. And that's a Type 15A where the yellow and black writing's around the other way. Quite interesting. Now then, Type 16. The Type 16 is the present day boxing and these have been utilised since 2008 and are still being used today. I really like the red framed boxes. I think they're very strong. They don't tend to crush in your uh, stash. And they are very vibrant and they're easy to find even from the other side of a model shop which is great. I've always found that the uh, the Hornby release products have been not just much of a top-notch level with the re-releases and new release kits and toolings, but the old release kits and the old toolings, they're easy to find as well, and they've given a flash of life to some of these models. I really like them. Now then, kits worthy of note. Airfix have made a number of kits that are very humdrum and run-of-the-mill, but they have made a number of kits that are really, really nice. They've also made, however, a number of kits which are real out-and-out -out howlers. And I'm going to present these in a slideshow very quickly for you. Kits worthy of note are the Piper Cherokee Arrow. The Piper Cherokee Arrow is a Series 1 kit. It was first released on a Type 4 blister pack. And as you can see from this image, it's a really nice model. It's a shame about his um, silvering there on the on the the uh, decal there but the kit is really nice I have built this kit before and um, it's got a bit of an ill-fitting canopy but you can deal with that quite easily by chaffering it down and then filling in the little tiny gap that might be left but the kit is really really nice and attractive to look at you also have the Scottish Aviation Bulldog which is another kit that's really really nice it's done in two different variants a Swedish Air Force variant and this one and both kits when finished are really nice and tasty looking kits and also, of course, don't forget the other Bristol Bulldog, the biplane. This kit, I'm building this kit at the moment, and it's absolutely superb. Um, I can't fault this kit. It is a bit tricky to build to get all those struts in the right place, but when it's jigged in and rigged, it looks fantastic. 
Um, yeah, very nice. They also, of course, built the Sopwith Pup, which is another gem from Airfix. I really, I built this kit before quite a long time ago, but I remember it was really, really nice. And this image shows how good the Sopwith Pup can look. And also, I wanted to introduce you to a ship, which a lot of people overlook. This is HMS Leander. She was um, a 19, late 1960s, 70s frigate. And quite a few of these were extensively used in the Cod War in the 1970s. You know that war where Iceland was fishing in our borders and these ships were going and cutting all their nets up so they couldn't fish anymore? This is an image showing F-127. I think this is HMS Phoebe. Um, the wasp helicopter on the back is quite crude, but it, it does look like a wasp, and the kit is actually quite accurate and quite nice. Series 2, they did a number of kits which I think were quite good as well. Um, but before we go into that, we've got the, the Scorpion and Matilda tanks. I think both of these two kits are really superb. The Scorpion, yeah, it might be small, but it's really accurate and a beautiful kit to build. And also in Series 2, sorry, in Series 2 we were going into, we've got the Britain Norman Islander, which of course is built in a Defender variant there, and the two models are shown here. You can see how the lines of the Islander have been faithfully reproduced, and the kit itself is absolutely fantastic. Um, there are no fit issues for this kit whatsoever, and it really does it really does build into a gem of a kit. Airfix also produced a really nice Vuga Magister. Um, they did it in two versions from this boxing. You could do the Patriel de France, or you could do a Belgium Air Force trainer. Both these kits versions look really pretty with the Airfix Vuga Magister. The only issue I did find with this kit is that it's a bit rivet city. Um, but if you sand the roots down, it's a beautiful, lovely looking model, really nice. They also did the Beagle Bassett in Series 2, which was, again, another kit really, really nice. And don't forget the Gloucester Meteor Mark III, another kit that's often overlooked. I actually think the Airfix Meteor Mark III is one of the better 72nd scale Meteor kits on the market. It's actually a bit tricky to get it to sit on its nose wheel. But when it's built, as you can see here, it looks quite the part. The Beagle Bassett is very colourful, very nice looking, attractive kit to put together and have in your display. Now, Airfix also built a couple of kits which you might find are acquired tastes. <laughs> acquired tastes because the Narvik class destroyer, when it's built as an Airfix kit out of the box, is a little bit bland in detail. But this particular person has filled in the additional detail which is missing from the kit and the rigging, and it looks really, really nice. But the thing you have to remember about the Narvik class destroyer is that it is really accurate and the parts are extremely good and really nice looking authentic parts that the kit builds up into a really really accurate model of the Narvik class destroyer very very nice indeed and the other kit that I featured here is the Airfix Scammel tank transporter now this kit is often um, experienced with de delight and glee and absolute hatred because there are certain parts of this kit that take hours and hours and hours of cleaning up. And I'm guessing this person that's built this kit has probably spent hours and hours and hours cleaning it up. Because the tyres on that kit look wonderful. But the Scammel is actually a really nice kit. And if you fit plastic card windows into the cab, it looks extremely nice. Series 3, you had the Airfix Navy Lynx. Another really nice kit, especially if you get the Mark 8. And the Command SH-2F Sea Sprite, another really nice kit. I've built both these two models, the, the Westland Navy Lynx recently, and the Sea Sprite, I'm after another model of this kit, because I want to build and do a review on it. It is superb. Very, very accurate, very nice looking, and an intricately detailed rotor head. Very nice. Airfix also did in Series 3 the De Havilland Canada DHC-4 Beaver. This kit is an absolute gem. Um, the, the finished product he's got here with this model looks really, really nice. But even if you build it up without the day glow strips and everything else, it's an extremely accurate and very attractive looking kit to have in your display. Airfix also did a helicopter kit, which a lot of people overlook, and I think it's a really nice addition to a display. They did it in two versions, originally releasing the American SH-3D Seeking, which commemorated the... Um, number 66 helicopter which was involved in picking up the Apollo 11 space crew you know the lunar landers 
Neil Armstrong and the like. And they also produce the Westland seeking. And the difference is there are a number of parts to interchange and replace the American seeking parts. But the main feature being the uh, the rotor, the, the tail rotor, which has six blades instead of five, and a number of aerials, including that radome that sits on the top. Um, later editions of this kit actually had a shield that fitted over the front of the air intakes, which is actually featured on the picture of the Palatoy blueprint boxing there just above that model. Um, this kit is really, really nice. I really enjoyed building this kit when I did build it a number of years ago. And the American variant is a very colourful and good looking kit to add to your collection as well. Now, Series 3 built a couple of ships that I really think are nice additions to a collection, HMS Fearless. Um, I did build this kit recently. She's a really nice looking kit. Lots and lots going on all over her deck and two Wessex helicopters. And also there are a couple of landing crafts in the back ramp which actually opens and closes. And there are a couple of landing craft which sit on the ship's upper deck, um, which are quite nice. And also there's HMS Suffolk, which is actually quite a large ship in Series 3, and she's reasonably well detailed as well. I found this kit a joy to build. She was really accurate, very nice looking model. Very much enjoyed that one too. Um, series 4, you've got the Schultz SC7 Skyvan, a really nice kit. Again, this is a bit tricky to build because the fuselage builds up in four slabs. But when it's finished, it's an extremely accurate and quite attractive looking model. Um, and also, Series 4 Airfix build one of the best twin engine bomber models I've ever seen. This is the B-26 Marauder. It has an incredibly detailed interior and bomb bay. And the undercarriage wells and bays and the engines are really, really good as well. This kit should never be sniffed at. And I think the new release, even though it's marked new... I think it's the original kit, but it's still extremely good. Airfix also built the Dassault Brigitte Mirage F1C. Not an awful lot of detail on this kit, but the Airfix Mirage F1 is actually a really accurate rendition of the Mirage F1. And although it's in Series 4, it's, a, it's quite a nice kit to build. I, I have built this kit a long, long, long time ago when I was a teenager. Um, and I've got another model of this to build in my stash, and uh, hopefully I'll be getting around to that one pretty soon as well. But it's a nice, nice, attractive and very accurate kit. Very accurate indeed. And also one of the best model ship kits Airfix have ever produced. And this is the Series 4 HMS Belfast. Believe it or not, this kit has 257 parts, and it is extremely detailed. Um, the kit has so many, so much detail going on on their decks that uh, it's actually a delight to paint, build and finish off. It's a real gem. This kit is a must-have for any shipbuilder's collection. Wonderful kit, HMS Belfast there. The other thing that's interesting is Belfast was done up in these colours when she met the Scharnhorst incident in the Battle of the North Cape, but there was another ship that was built as a sister ship to Belfast in HMS Edinburgh, and you can build HMS Edinburgh from the same model. She was identical. And again, I've got two of these kits in the stash to do just that. Um, Airfix also produced two kits in Series 5 that were quite nice. The B Interdictor Mark VI Canberra, a really nice kit, quite nice to build, but a nightmare to get it to fit on its, uh, sit on its, under, on its undercarriage properly. But it is a nice, really nice, quite well detailed kit, nicely finished. And also, this kit is one that a lot of people overlook. Yes, it's a World War I biplane, and it's quite large. But any of you guys who like to rig biplanes, and I know there are a number of you out there and you know who you are, this kit is purposely built for you because all of the holes to rig this kit are actually preformed in the parts. So you can rig this kit before you assemble the wings and everything is there laid out ready for you. It's a superb kit. It's very accurate actually and quite an impressive model to build and put together and put on your side unit but I must ex express the fact that it's quite big. Airfix also produced a couple of ships in HMS Repulse and the King George V. And again, these two kits are extremely detailed and very accurate models. The Repulse, again, is one of the best battleship models Airfix have ever produced. She's an absolute beaut. Um, and also don't forget the USS Forrestal in Series 8 and in Series 9 and sometimes Series 10, the Lockheed C-130 Hercules. 
This image here looks like a photo. The model has been finished that good. But you can see the Airfix Bloodell missile and Land Rover loading into the rear ramp. And if you look very carefully, the kit is actually a model with there's a slight seam line there on the cabin which gives it away. But that picture makes that kit look, it looks real. Very, very nice and well done model. But Hercules has got certain fit issues and nightmares which people have to overcome. But it does build into a very impressive and reasonably accurate kit. Um, and the original release also had the Bloodhound missile and Land Rover set included in the kit. And this kit, the USS Forrestal, is the biggest ship model Airfix have built. And again, I've built this kit and featured it on one of my slideshows. And it's a really, really nice, quite busy model on the deck with lots going on, including shunter and cranes for manoeuvring the, uh, the aircraft about. Nice kit, very nice indeed. They also built a couple of... Um, 72nd scale boats which I don't think should be marked out as not being wonderful kits. The Vosper MTB I think is actually a really nicely detailed kit. It has got inaccuracy issues with the front end of the gunner's position here. I'm not sure 100% but I've seen a few reviews where there are issues with that gunner's position but the rest of the kit is really really nice and you can detail this kit up quite well which this fella has actually done. But the kit is really, really nice, very enjoyable build. And the RAF launch, these two turrets actually move. And the, the boat itself is really, really accurate. Very, very accurate and really nice fitting kit. Beautiful. And also, of course, one of their best motor torpedo boats that Airfix have ever released. The famous German E-boat, which was re-released by Hornby as the famous German S-boat. Not quite sure why it was called an E-boat or an S-boat or which was which was correct. I'm not quite sure, but um, the S-boat was short for Schnell boat. And the E-boat, I don't know what it was short for, but a lot of the Royal Navy uh, referred to these boats as E-boats. Um, interesting. But this is another one of my gotta-have kits if you're interested in small small um, craft in large scales. 72nd scale there for all three of those. The one kit you need never to leave out is the Airfix BAE Nimrod. Now, I've seen this kit made up several times, and each time it never fails to amaze me and awe me. This kit is awesome when it's put together. It looks absolutely beautiful, and I can't think of a better kit to have as an addition to your to your display. Um, the Nimrod is, is a true gem. It comes in four different variants as well, and you can even build a reconnaissance variant, which is really nice too. So that's the BAE Nimrod. And don't forget the 12 scale 4.5 litre Bentley blower. This is probably one of the best kits Airfix have ever produced. Um, it's incredibly accurate. It's very, very impressive. And it builds up into a very highly detailed and very highly accurate kit. Really, really nice. Now then, we've gone through some of the kits worthy of notes. We've also got to, through, we've got to go through the number of howlers that Airfix have done. So please avoid all of these. At all costs. The first of these is the Bolton and Paul Defiant NF Mark 1 and their early tooling of the, Douglas, uh, of the Gloucester Gladiator Mark 1. Now to talk about the Defiant, the Defiant is an, it's just simply a dreadful kit. It's so bad that I would never even want one given to me. It's dreadful, awful kit. The, the turrets, the guns are too big, the cockpit's too small, the propeller's too small. The entire front end of the aircraft's airframe is too narrow, it's too spindly. The wings don't look right, the undercarriage is abysmal. Everything about this kit is just, God, it's just a, it's a joke, it's a laugh. The airframe on the Gladiator isn't actually that bad. It's a little bit fat and waxy here and there. But the main issue I have with this kit is the fact that there's no cockpit in it. It's a flat plate with a neck and head sticking out the top of it. And the canopy is big enough and clear enough for you to see the fact that there's just a head and neck sticking out of it. The kit looks absolutely hideous um, and should be avoided at all costs. The next two are the Hawker Typhoon 1B and the Royal Aircraft Factories RE8. Now I've mentioned on a couple of videos about the Airfix Typhoon. The Airfix Typhoon is quintessentially dreadful. The cockpit is dreadful. The airframe is pretty dreadful. The front end of the propeller, the propeller especially, everything is just awful about this kit. I can't think of any reason why I would ever want it. 
and the RE8 isn't a bad rendition of the RE8. The tail fin's a bit garbage, but the worst thing about this kit is the detail on the front end of the airframe and the pilots. The pilots look like they've been deflated. They look like they've had all the life sucked out of them, and it shows. <laughs> the kit is absolutely dreadful. The next two models are the Supermarine Spitfire Mark 9 and the Jet Provost T Mark 3. Both these two kits should be avoided like the plague. This particular kit hasn't got a terrible airframe and even the cockpit's not that bad. The thing that's wrong with it is that the propeller spinner is far too narrow, the exhaust stubs are far too big and the front end of the airframe is just completely the wrong shape and the undercarriage looks a little bit spindly, it just doesn't look right and the Jet Provost T Mark 3. Well, yeah, there's not an awful lot you can say about that. <laughs> it's, it's just dreadful. Awful kit. Not worth even looking at, let alone buying and building. The de Havilland Mosquito FB Mark VI and the Messerschmitt ME110D. These are the early tools. These kits should be avoided like the plague. The Mosquito is plain and evident. The cockpit canopy is dreadful. The undercarriage is slightly too big for the airframe. The airframe just hasn't got any texture detail on it whatsoever, apart from the rudder, which is quite nice, but the rest of the aircraft is just a bore. It's an abortion. Terrible kit. And the BF110, this kit has some airframe issues and problems. The propellers don't even, they're not even the right shape. But the main issue I have with this kit is that the cockpit canopy doesn't fit at all properly, and the nose section at the front of the aircraft is actually wider than the rest of the airframe. And it just looks atrocious. An atrocious kit. Terrible. Now then, one of the biggest howlers Airfix have ever done, and I have to talk about another kit when I look at this one as well, is the Heinkel HE111H20. The airframe isn't that bad. The upper gunner isn't that bad. The undercarriage is a bit spindly and thin. The propellers, they're, they're all right. But the main problem with this kit is the cockpit. The cockpit canopy... And the cockpit is devoid of detail, but the canopy itself is made up in two halves. And there's another kit that this, this problem uh, is featured in, and that's the Bristol 192 Belvedere, where the canopy, the canopy sections are made up in two halves. And how anyone is supposed to glue those two halves, and in the Heinkel they're actually three parts building that. No, it's two, sorry, it is two, it's not, it's not one. The, this, can, this entire greenhouse canopy is two bits of plastic. And how are you supposed to glue that together without misting up the canopy? I'll never know. But this guy's done a pretty good job, but it's still an awful, terrible kit. Avoid this one like the plague and buy the new tool release. It's much, much better. And now we lead on to one of the worst kits Airfix have ever released. This is the 1600 scale Bismarck and Turpids. Now, looking at this image, you'd think, well, oh, that's actually quite nice, isn't it? The superstructure of the kit is actually quite good. Um, the problem with the kit is the deck. The actual hull on the deck is just too short and too thick and wide. The stern section is a little bit too wide, and it's not long enough. And the bow section should be about another two inches longer. Sorry, no, another one inch longer, but it should be about half an inch narrower in front of the forward turret, in front of um, Anton turret there. If that was the case, the Airfix Bismarck would be an absolute gem. But unfortunately it's not. It's a nightmare. It's a nice build. It's a really nice, easy kit to build. Very impressive to build up. But this deck makes this kit one of the worst, worst ship models you can buy of the Bismarck on the market. And of course it's the same parts for the Turpits, so the same goes with that as well. Now then, before I say that's all, folks, I've just put this up because there's no more slides to go. But I do want to say something before I leave. Like many of you, Airfix has been a massive influence on me as a child, and I'm still pulled to their older kits with nostalgia, terrible as some of them may be. I've been very impressed with the Hornby release kits, but it is worthy of note that some of their model releases are just the older moulds reboxed. I do feel, however, that Hornby as a company are trying to address the fact that some of their older moulds are terrible, with many of their new releases seeming to replace the tired and not very good older kit releases from the 1950s and the 1960s. The future of Airfix looks pretty settled for now, but it is worthy of note that Airfix 
is a model brand that has been sold many, many times, but it stayed firmly as Airfix brand as a product, with each new owner understanding what the name Airfix means to this industry. It is probably a name that will stay with us for as long as plastic modelling is with us, and that can almost be stated as a fact. I hope this video has been of some use. I hope um, that all of this research and putting together this, this slideshow is worth it. Um, and I know the video is quite long. Um, I'm sorry about that, but Airfix is a very interesting and very lengthy historical company. Um, if you have any questions or queries or any comments you want, just pop them in the comments box. Any questions, I'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. And thanks for tuning in and watching, and I hope all your modelling projects are going really, really smooth. Bye for now. I'll see you for the next video. Bye-bye, lads.